coronavirus pandemic has been catastrophic for the hospitality industry. But COVID restrictions have been lifted and restaurants are back. I'm Tim Hayward. I'm a restaurateur, cook and food critic. I'm Daniel Garahan. I'm a Financial Times journalist and I love to eat out. Today, we've come to Bristol in England's West Country, home of one of the UK's hottest restaurant scenes. But the pandemic disrupted supply chains, led to staff shortages and changed where we live, work and dine out. We want to see how restaurants are adapting to all of this and what the future holds. Our first stop is Wilson's in a residential corner of the city. Tim, COVID has been a nightmare for restaurants up and down the country. Bristol is no exception. And it's not a city I know well, but we've come here today. It's got one of the most exciting restaurant scenes in the country. It has. I've been coming here for, well, I was born here, weirdly, but I've been coming back here for years because I just think it's had the most vibrant scene imaginable. Lots of exciting little places run by cool people in interesting communities and environments, and this is one of them. Wilson's was my favourite restaurant of the year, two years ago, I think, in the FT, because there's no one like it. It's, it's, just, it's exactly what you want as your local. The food is absolutely superb. They've got a real farm-to-plate operation going on here. Yeah, sustainability seems to be the, the buzzword at this place. Should we go and check out the farm, see what they're up to? I think we should. Let's do it. Eighty-five percent of the stuff on the menu is from here. So almost self-sufficient. You get that, That's the ambition. Getting, yeah, I mean, the the, uh, the ambition is to be totally a unique experience created from the earth of Bristol. And does this mean that your menu is completely seasonal? I mean, how how often does it change? It changes when it's ready. Soon we're going to have loads and loads of tomatoes and we're going to have tomatoes on the menu for a long time. And we're going to have tomatoes on one or two or three courses because that's what we've got. It would be simpler to buy it from somebody else. But you know, this is, that's not why we do a restaurant, right? There's a simpler way. So to why, why not go for the simple option? Why, why, why do you do this? On a purely professional reason, when you pick something and put it on the plate within a 24 hour period, it is stunning. You need to do almost nothing to it. When you eat, a freshly picked and cooked beetroot. It is unbelievable the complexity it has. On a moral level, we need to do whatever we can in whatever way we can to, to make it our, our little micro difference. So what's the business case for doing it? Better quality of product. People will pay a premium. I think, I think people do pay a premium. We don't charge a premium, but people do, will pay a premium. When we said we wanted to open a restaurant, it was always going to be called Wilson's. Initially, I thought it was all about me, but quietly, Mary sort of steadied the ship. Mary's the sort of the captain who, who doesn't need to lots of attention. She just steers the ship and it's, it's, it's her restaurant, it's her name. Russian capers, yeah, we'll pickle them once all of this turns into capers. Like a big farm, if you get a big crop of something, you put it into preservation and storage yeah, and things like that yeah, if you can. Yeah, exactly, if we can. Oh, this is great. It's a really intriguing scale, isn't it? Because this is just so much bigger than amateur gardening. Yeah, we're just trying to kind of, because it's two of us doing it, mm. and we're not using machinery, and we're trying our best not to use any machinery. You know, things like crop protection we have to do. We've got deer, we've got rabbits, we've got badger. On top of everything else? On top of everything else. <laughs> So when we think back to the start of the pandemic, obviously you were, you were producing some spectacular produce here. Suddenly the restaurants are closed. You don't know when they're going to reopen. Yeah. What did you do next? What happened to all this amazing produce? We donated a lot of it to the NHS. Um, we cooked a lot of it and gave it away. We just would prefer to, to, that it went into mouths and it went into bodies and went back into the live stream and then went into the bin. We just kept on picking, kept on growing. You can't stop this. It's not like a restaurant that, you can fire it up in a week and you can close it down in a week. This, this is years of planning. In normal times, in pre-pandemic times or post-pandemic times, does that mean that there's less waste in the restaurant than there would be there's, if you were relying on other suppliers? I mean, to be honest with you, like there's effectively zero waste because it depends how you define waste. Is waste. If waste is something that goes into a landfill, we don't create any waste from this. All the trimmings go into a bin, come back to the farm and get composted and go back into the earth. I'm also fascinated by your tubs over here. What on earth are these? So this is where we're making compost teas as a part of not overextending ourselves and what is possible for this plot to produce. 
we're trying our hardest not to bring um, anything from the outside in. And you use it as a, like a spray-on fertiliser? Yeah, exactly. So we're using minimal inputs from outside. Something that is really important and something that I think people should really focus on is small-scale local agriculture. You know, it means so much more than walking into a supermarket and getting a certified organic yeah. yes. produce because it can come from anywhere. When you think back and reflect on the last 18 months, did the, the uncertainty inspire creativity? I mean, it probably had to. Yeah, I think we changed a lot of things. We did a lot of things differently. We started new things. We started a bakery. We started making videos. We started doing loads of stuff. When people ask me about the pandemic, I still say I wouldn't have changed it. It's given me a fresh insight into what's important and why I do it, what I do. Our next stop is Little French, a short drive up the road from Wilson's. We've got much busier. I mean, now we, it was almost, I think there was that idea of latent demand, but then it, it's also just that latent demand has just continued into this sort of constantly busy, um, you know, I always wanted to be a neighbourhood restaurant, and we still are a neighbourhood restaurant, but it's also just attracting people from all over as well. So the number of covers you can actually serve now on the either side of lockdown is more than you had in the original restaurant you went into it with? Y yeah, I mean, so we were a 45-seater in here at its max, um, and we had to reduce that down to about 20 at the height of spreading people out there, so we put another 35 outside. Now, as we've been able to get people closer together, we're doing more covers, and we're probably half again our covers every day. I'm guessing this is the sort of place that professionals who aren't currently going to the office actually live. Yeah. And they're getting all the benefits of having a nice time with their families and living locally and finding out local, and you're, you're supplying to that group. Do you feel that that decision to be neighbourhood has played well for you through this? Uh, uh, yeah, 100%. The, the, the most supportive people are our, our neighbours. Of course, you know, as a restaurant, people come from far and wide. But through lockdown, supporting us with our food boxes, supporting us when we were a shop, supporting us, it's all been community. And the one thing that I'm, I'm really keen to do is always keep tables for Locals, that there's always an opportunity. I, always I was going people. to ask, that's interesting. Yeah. yeah. So it's, if it's my wife's birthday and I live two streets away, I can yeah. beg. And it's and and it, get the same busy night. And we're, we're, of course, we're full on the restaurant diary. Mm. But call up, drop in, come and see us. You live late, we will, do, we will work it out. Yeah. And that to me is really important. They've looked after us, I want to look after them. Mm. And they're, they're your bread and butter for life. When you're not eating out and you see the quality of what you're buying in supermarkets, which is all we, all, all we seem to have had, people suddenly recognised what it was that was important to them in life. Mm -hmm. And it's sitting around a table with their, with, their, with, with, their, with their friends, with their family, eating incredible quality ingredients. And as soon as that's taken away from them, mm. I think people were nervous that mm. that, would be, that would be gone, that if they didn't look after us, there was going to be this homogenous high street where, where the big boys moved in later and you'd never get it back. So you're still using lots of suppliers just tight around Bristol? Uh, yeah. Around Bristol and, and Spain and, and France and whatnot, but it's the fact that I have people that I've got relationships with for the last 15 years. I have a relationship with a guy who's got a 15 year relationship, yeah. with a guy who's got a 50 year relationship yeah. with these things, but it's the restaurants that keep those, those alive. The supermarkets want, want the ease of the most convenient and the, and the highest profit margins, whereas we're looking for the interesting and the, and the diverse and, the, and, the, and, and, and sort of the more niche stuff where there's a story. And that's the other thing I think people have, have because they weren't eating it out, they want the story. They want to know more about where everything they've got is, is, is coming from. In amongst all of this, the small people are the people that are going to weirdly grow. They'll stay small, I think. Maybe we'll have two or three sites. Maybe we'll have two or three, but we're never going to become enormous. Mm -hmm. But that's what's going to give the diversity and the excitement. And if I look at the high street here, the independent bookshop, the fishmonger, the butchers, we've opened a bakery. Big wine selection, the cheese that we use in the restaurant, the meat. The wine that you sell in the restaurant. The wines that we're selling in the restaurant. So this rewinds to sort of March last year. What was going through your mind at that point? Uh, this is a restaurant that had only been open the eight, eight been months. Open eight months. It was, <laughs> why now? There were people desperate to sell produce, our butcher, our veg man, all these people that we wanted to keep working with. We also, people wanted bread, people wanted flour. They wanted the basics in life, but they wanted the pleasures as well. So we, it was, you know, good bread. People were always asking us, can you make bread? We couldn't make enough bread for people. So we weren't baking bread. I was buying bread in. I thought, well, hang on a sec. 
there's a, there's a market for this up here. We can sell a, a good few hundred loaves a day in our neighbourhood. This wasn't just a charitable endeavour, right? This became a smart business response to a crisis. It was, and people didn't want to queue outside supermarkets. They wanted to come to our shop and that we'd set up in a restaurant. People were, were more excited by it. Then we'd sort of started doing, let's, let's sell online so people could see beforehand and it made the process a bit quicker. They could come and could just collect something and, and walk away with it. So it made the shopping experience quicker. And then it became, oh my goodness me, this is restaurant quality produce. This is incredible value. Why am I going to the supermarket? And then we said, well, actually, let's just build a shop. And let's stack that out. It was like, well, if we're doing a bakery and we're doing a shop, we might as well do a cafe. And then we went, let's, say, well, let's get it licensed and it became a bit of a wine bar as well. It just kind of, kind of grew like that. In the middle of all of this, I mean, we've gone from being a, a 45-seater restaurant that when I first set out before the pandemic, I thought would employ six, eight, ten people. Turns out that's employing 30. Down here, we're employing nearly 20. And the business is now a bit sort of a little mini beast, if you like. Did, Did you I'm... ever think you'd be doing something like this before the pandemic? No. So Tim, once again, we've seen how the pandemic is a crisis, but it can also present opportunity. I think that's the most fascinating part about this. It's not a great sort of admission that suddenly rents are going to be dropping down to sensible levels, but people are doing deals quietly. You know, it's an empty shop. We haven't got anything else to do with it. We don't like it being empty. Uh, you know, coffee's great. You can put it in. It's a really simple thing to set up. Do a little bit of woodwork around the outside and suddenly, I mean, yeah, this could be Sydney, this could be San Francisco. Yes. It's kind of lovely. And there are interesting things going on with the supply chain too, which has been disrupted by the pandemic. I mean, Wilsons are using pretty much 85% of their own produce, yep. whereas here um, with Little French, they're supporting the local suppliers. They didn't want to see them go out of business in the short term at the start of the pandemic. And what we're seeing now is actually an opportunity. But it's, it's, they're not just serving uh, the butcher's meat in the, in the restaurant, they're serving it here in the deli as well. The community is, is a, again, it's a theme that we're seeing again and again. But if you're in one of those areas and you're lucky enough to have that loyal community mm -hmm. who don't want to lose their, their favorite restaurants, um, who, who are going out of their way to support them, these guys have got a much better chance than those who are perhaps stuck in the city centres where the office workers that used to support those businesses just aren't there anymore. Yes, but this is the other thing that we, we need to think about in any analysis of this, which is it's almost by postcode. You and I have been to the city in the last couple of weeks. We've driven through central London and it's like a zombie movie. Yeah. You know, there's, and there's billions of pounds worth of office space that are just not being used. And yet the business lunch is now happening in the residential area. We're, see, we're seeing that oh, God, yes. certainly here. And it was terrifying in the early days, but actually some of these businesses are emerging in a better place than they, than they were before the pandemic. Mm -hmm.